So, you know, today's talk is primarily about, obviously, the Atlanteans, which are really these Anunnaki people. Anunnaki is a umbrella term for people who come from heaven to earth or from space to earth. And it doesn't matter what planet they come from, as long as they come from heaven to earth, they're considered Anunnaki. This particular group, though, these Atlanteans, they're well documented here. And they left behind a lot of evidence uh, in architectural uh, uh, motifs and, and, uh, and megalithic structures. And they also left behind a lot of text for us to read. Uh, and so to me, that's a lot of evidence. And the evidence for me is leading to a major, major situation, which we're going to cover today. Here I'm standing inside of the um, Temple of Abydos. And in this Temple of Abydos, in the ceiling, there are hieroglyphs. And I assure you, these hieroglyphs have never been touched. The uh, homegrown archaeologist, homegrown guide that I went out there with uh, said that the mainstream uh, commercialized guides are told by the Board of uh, you know, uh, Tourism that they're supposed to say that these hieroglyphs were retouched and that's why they look like technology. These hieroglyphs are even clear from my perspective standing there, have never been touched. They swear that they have never been touched and everybody in Egypt uh, who lives there knows that they haven't been touched and that this is, wasn't the only place that these glyphs were located. They were located in multiple locations and in different writings. And I was fortunate enough to be able to see a lot of those and document those. So these technological hieroglyphs appear to be all over Egypt. It's pretty amazing stuff. Here I am at Olin Tatumbo. I'm at the top of the mountain. Um, this is one of the most amazing places in the world because there's an actual fortress at the top of this mountain and the fortress has megalithic stones and those megalithic stones, which aren't in this particular photo, were taken from another mountain about, uh, you know, almost a couple hundred miles away by the time you tally up how much, how, how, how far you have to travel to get up there to quarry them. It's really amazing stuff, how they go up and down mountains with, you know, five uh, ton stones and so forth. Um, 1,000 ton tones as well. This is Machu Picchu. What an amazing place this is. Um, I was fortunate enough to hike up Machu Picchu. And uh, this place truly is a place of the gods. It's an amazing place where uh, there's evidence to me of terraforming, like this gigantic face in the background looking up at the sky. You can just, from this angle, you can only see the nose and maybe the forehead. But from another angle, you'll be able to see it's an entire face looking up at the sky. And that is a super massive mountain that was completely terraformed using some type of advanced technology. Uh, and there's some amazing places there. You, if you've never been to Machu Picchu, I really recommend it, but make sure you're in shape before you go because the oxygen there is extremely thin and some people could not make the hike. They had to stop. Here I am at Saxe Huaman. This is uh, my guide. He's a homegrown guide. His name is Elvis. I always get uh, homegrown guides. Uh, yes, his real name is Elvis, by the way. <laughs> That's what his mom named him. Uh, she must have been a fan. But uh, he grew up, was born and grew up there. Uh, and um, his, his, uh, his uncle is a sage. He's, uh, you know, they have, he's friends with witch doctors. I mean, this is like a real guide. This is what I consider to be a real guide. Behind these stones that I'm standing in front of, there's even hidden gold, which is why the military guards this area night and day as well. Here I am over here at um, Ta Prom in Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Um, I had a, oh, that went too fast. I had a great time in Cambodia. Um, Cambodia is an amazing place to hike 37 miles in the jungles of Cambodia. And uh, that was with 100% 100, 100, humidity and 120 degree um, heat every single day, okay, for seven days straight. What an amazing trip it was, uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, and I got to see something really interesting here, which let me move this out the way. Dinosaurs in, uh, you know, etched into stone, proving that dinosaurs did walk with man at one particular time. Yes, a, a large amount of them were wiped out by some type of a nuclear event. And I do mean nuclear because when you go to the museums, you discover that the bones of the dinosaurs are painted with lead paint. And the reason why they're painted with lead paint is to keep the radiation from coming out. Uh, because the radiation in most dinosaur bones is two to three times higher than the background radiation. What could cause that? Well, weapon signature can cause that. So weapons definitely took out the majority of the dinosaurs. However, uh, some did survive and human beings lived amongst them 
and documented them, not only here in Cambodia, but in many other places around the world, including the hinge that was discovered in the uh, Lake Michigan in the United States. Um, there's also Gobekli Tempe, which has these giant stone pillars etched with dinosaurs in them in Turkey and similar for Turkey. So all over the planet, you'll find that human beings had seen, witnessed, and interacted directly with dinosaurs. Here I am at uh, Akrotiri in Greece. This is a huge dig site. You can't even see the full dig site from this angle. But the reason why it was so amazing, this is one of the very last digs on an ancient Atlantean site. This is one of the cities of Atlantis uh, in Akrotiri that you can actually go to and see the dig live and you can see technology right there on the spot. Toilets on the second story that flush, a complete plumbing system running through the, through the entire city before it got covered by ash from a volcano. You can see technology where they have uh, two and three meter blocks, but there's, there's like a four millimeter uh, with a four diameter hole going straight through from one side to the other, okay? Technology can do that, not chicken bones and copper uh, sticks and copper chisels. So it's really amazing. And they had other areas where there were some intricate pieces that were there that I took photos of. And I did a whole blog about this and put all the photos up. A lot of technology in Akrotiri, Greece at this dig site, proving that these Atlantean people were very extreme and uh, extremely uh, talented and extremely technologically advanced. One of the amazing things about the toilet, not only was it on the second story, but it was able to flush and it had a suction mechanism to suck, suction out any smells <laughs> to the outside. Uh, so this toilet in a lot of ways is probably better than toilets we have today. I think there's a lot of places that can <laughs> utilize that technology right now. Here I am at the top of, uh, I'm standing on top of the Pyramid of the Moon, and behind me is the Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan, Mexico. Uh, that was, I think that was back in um, 2014. Uh, this is, again, another pyramid of the great um, Atlantean, Thoth, T-H-O-T-H. -H. You can call him Toth, Thoth, I call him Thoth. Uh, he's also known as Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, Veracocha, Lord Pakal, uh, many, many names, uh, of course, in Mesoamerica. He was a Teotihuacan. He founded the Teotihuacan civilization and built the pyramid I'm standing on for his wife. The one behind me is a copy of the one that he built in Giza. Uh, and it is exactly 50% the height, identical on the base, and also built on top of an aquifer because the one behind me, the Pyramid of the Sun, is a power generation device as well, just like the one at Giza in Egypt. And uh, what's amazing is these pyramids here in Teotihuacan are perfectly aligned with the Orion, just like the ones in Giza as well. And here I am standing in front of the giant Kukulkan pyramid. Uh, and this pyramid is basically a calendar. It's a giant calendar. This is not a power generator. This one is a calendar made for keeping celestial time and annual time and rotations around the sun down in the Yucatan Peninsula. So I'd like to give a, th a quick shout out before I get into this um, to my admins on Anunnaki history uh, because they do a lot of hard work for me and my groups. Some of you may or may not know, but I have a lot of groups and a lot of pages and a lot of Instagram accounts, a lot of social media accounts in general. In total, I have 139 social media accounts across all platforms. And this particular group, Anunnaki History, is one of my largest online groups on Facebook. And these are the admins for that group. Don Jensen, Alex Teplish, uh, Thomas Mikey Jensen Schroeder, James Tracy, Nikki Reyna, Tone Bone, <laughs> uh, Dolly, Thomas. Uh, well, some of them are duplicates. We have the same admin twice in there. Ed Parker, Bianca, Dominic Joyce, uh, of course, myself, Tina Salt, uh, Bianca, JJ Ainsworth, and Renee Molinari. I want to thank them very much for their contribution to help me run and manage uh, Anunnaki history on Facebook. Our story today is gonna to start off in the Pleiadian star system. Now the Pleiades is mentioned in a lot of text. Uh, it's well known, well documented area of the sky where you'll see the seven sisters is what they're called uh, in the biblical text. They're called, uh, uh, you know, the, the Pleiades, uh, Homer's Iliad is mentioned the Pleiades. And these stars, there's, from our perspective on Earth, it appears to be seven bright stars, 
But in reality, it's many more stars than that. Now, these stars have planets and those planets have life. And those planets also have moons. And some of those moons that orbit those planets have life as well. This is a very active part of the sky uh, that is a really amazing uh, part of our ancient history because our progenitors come from here, come from there. <coughs> we literally come from the Pleiades. So the Pleiades or Pleiades, however you want to call it, 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 I mean, when you really dig into them and research them, you start to discover that there was an ancient galactic war millions of years ago in that sector of the galaxy. And what's further, what's also interesting, furthermore, what's also interesting is the fact that um, these, uh, these people became space refugees and spread out all around, you know, different regions of space and eventually seeded some planets with life. And we're going to find out the whole story today. And we're also going to find out where we came from as well. So like I was saying, there was the Galactic War in the Pleiades. Now this Galactic War was um, something you would see in Star Wars, literally. Like it was really a Star Wars battle. Planetary destroyers, uh, you know, Death Stars, people being blown up and killed in space. The Lyrians versus Syrians. Uh, it was massive. It was, just, it was an emperor. It was an empire. It was, just, it was just like Star Wars, which leads me to believe that the makers of Star Wars uh, George Lucas in particular, read a couple of texts. One was the Terra Papers, which reads just like his movies, and also, which is an uh, indigenous Indian epic. And then also uh, the second would be the Enuma Elish, which I think he got a lot of information from as well, which we're going to touch on the Enuma Elish today uh, in depth, okay, as we go into other texts as well. But I really do believe that there was a galactic war that started in the Pleiadian star system and then made its way across uh, the galaxy. A lot of information for what I'm talking about with uh, the Pleiades having a galactic war and different species fighting each other from different planets and planetary destroyers and death stars and, and, and space refugees and all of that. A lot of the research can be found from Burnham Celestial Handbook, Star Names, Their Lore and Meaning, Star Lore of All Ages, Star Tales, The Age of Fable, The Greek Myths, the Reader's Encyclopedia 2E, American Heritage Dictionary, Fundamentals of Physics. So that's where I get my theory of an ancient galactic war, combining all that information together and helping to paint a picture in my own mind with my own discernment and then now sharing it with everyone else. The space refugees, when they fled that region, some went to this star system called Sirius, which is a trinary star system. It means it's got three suns. Okay, A, B, and C, the Sirius star system. You can only see mostly A from perspective on Earth because of the brightness of A. But B is a, is a um, failed star, in other words, ran out of fuel, and, and C is there as well. So it's a trinary. Then you have Orion's belt, which, of, of course, a lot of people here on Earth are very familiar with Orion's belt. And Orion's belt is attributed to or owned by Osiris, the ancient Egyptian god Osiris who uh, really predates Egypt by, by probably 100,000 years. Uh, and he predates the Kemetic region, the Kemetic names by, by probably another 100,000 years. He was one of the very first to come here in super antiquity. I mean, super, super antiquity, about 450,000 years ago, uh, and helped to establish civilization on this planet from his race of people, from, where, uh, from his planet. Now, he was attributed to Orion's belt, the Orion. Uh, and what's interesting is a lot of these ancient gods who were, ki who were kings and rulers had star systems and planets and moons attributed to them because they actually owned them. People actually owned these planets and moons and star systems and constellations. In particular, Osiris owned the Orion's belt, uh, which means that he was the king not only of where he was here, when he was here, but he was also a king of another star system entirely. Uh, some made it over to Aldebaran, Hades, and the Pleiades. Of course, some people still survived in that region of the sky as well. So we have people spread out all over the place as this galactic war uh, took place. And when you blow up a planet, a planet will leave, uh, will create a lot of debris, like our asteroid belt is an exploded planet, which we're gonna, we're gonna talk about today. And that debris will then flow through space and gravitationally be connected to other planets and moons, hit them, 
collide with them and cause those planets and moons to also sometimes explode or create so much debris that it destroys those planets and moons. Uh, and so people had to start fleeing. That's how you get space refugees. They're fleeing for their lives, literally, uh, when that situation happened. And that region of space was so messy for such a long period of time, the only way to survive, the best way to survive was to just get the heck out of there. And that's why people left. So today we're gonna to talk about so many different things. In particular, you know, this is uh, a planet uh, that is mentioned in the Enuma Elish that has this particular orbit. It's actually a brown dwarf star. You can see in the lower left corner, this brown dwarf star has planets orbiting it and it orbits our sun. So today I'm gonna to show you not only about information about the Atlanteans and their texts and their megalithic structures and the anomalies that left behind, and also I'm gonna show you some space anomalies, but also this brown dwarf star, what's really interesting is that it, uh, it orbits our sun, which means we live in a binary, solar system. We live in a solar system with two suns. One dim sun that you can see with the infrared uh, telescope uh, and the other one is our bright white sun that you can see. Uh, some people think it's yellow but the sun actually burns white. We get yellow because of fractals but it is a white star. So we have our uh, brown dwarf and we have our main sun and they orbit each other in a, in a binary system and binaries are actually the norm which we're finding out and we're learning more about. So we're gonna talk about the Enuma Elish first and the seven types of creation. Uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this one versus some of the other texts, just because this text is so powerful and so mind blowing and what's in it will really awaken you to the true history of our ancient past. Uh, and and I'm, gonna even gonna show, I'm gonna even show you how uh, scribes would write this text, how they would actually scribe it onto uh, tablets. So you can get to understand like the work that it takes just to write one sentence is so incredible. Nobody had time to sit around and make this stuff up. Okay. This is an amazing epic tale. And the majority of the Old Testament of the Bible copied their information from the Enuma Elish in most cases, word for word. Okay. And in some cases when it was too much to write, they just kind of uh, subligated it and and made it into whatever they could and added some of their own context to it. But the old, the Enumi Elish primarily is where the Bible gets a lot of their, the Old Testament. This is what the tablets look like here. The Enuma Elish, the seven tablets of creation. And these are the tablets here. These tablets are on display at the British Museum. Uh, you can actually go and visit the tablets. The tablets are real. It's not a mythological thing or something that nobody can get their hands on or find. We know about the tablets extensively and I'm gonna go into the history of these tablets with you today. <clears throat> Just a little bit. The Enuma Elish is the Akkadian cuneiform, also spelled Enuma Elish. It's a, it's a Babylonian creation myth. It was recovered by Austin Henry Laird in 1849 in the ruined library of Ashurbanipal at Nineveh, which is in Mosul, Iraq. Iraq is really the cradle of civilization, guys. For, uh, for Homo sapien, and published by George Smith in 1876. Now, this is inter interesting. I want you guys to stop right there for a second. Uh, there's books that came out by a famous author named Zachariah Sitchin, which I love and have so much respect for. Uh, they tried to dirty up his name before he died at the end in his 90s, unfortunately, and make his work look like he just uh, made up these stories and he was the only person that can translate these tablets. Well, that's false. And again, that's where a lot of the fake news comes from in the conscious community. As a matter of fact, Zachariah Sitchin didn't translate any tablets. He took, his work was all based off of tablets that were already translated. And he provided his sources for everything that he utilized to create his theory in his books, in every single book. And he would even at, every, at the end of every paragraph, he would tell you where he got the information from to create that, to create the context of what he, what he wrote. So Zachariah Sitchin wasn't the only person that can translate um, cuneiform tablets. And the tablets that he utilized to create, to write his stories came from pre-translated material before he was even born. So let me clear that up from the beginning. The Enuma Elish uh, has about a thousand lines as it, and is recorded in old Babylonian on seven clay tablets, each holding between 115 and 170 lines of Sumo Arcadian cuneiform script. Most of Tablet 5 had never been recovered until recently. Tablet 5 was discovered at the Somalia Museum in Iraq. 
This epic is one of the most important sources for understanding the Babylonian worldview centered on the supremacy of Marduk. Now Marduk or Marduk, however you want to say it, is also known as Amun-Ra, okay? And this was a person that really did exist. Uh, not only did he exist, he made it into the modern day Bible. His names are in there. And the creation of humankind for the service of the gods. Its primary original purpose, however, is not an exposition of theology or theology, but the elevation of Marduk, the chief god of Babylon, above all other Mesopotamian gods. You see this Marduk guy, he's the one who ushered in the, Meso, uh, the monotheistic uh, mindset, one god religion. He was jealous of his other relatives, uh, these Anunnaki beings who all came here. They, gave, they were issued regions of the planet to rule over, regions of Atlantis to rule over. And it was getting him pissed off that he wasn't the only one being worshipped to the point where he even went, created a war out of this. Uh, and um, he then, uh, he, he made everybody that he was ruling over uh, claimed that he was the one and true only God, which made it into the Bible. And to also, every time they gave thanks for anything, that to give praises and thanks to him. So that's where we get amen from. It doesn't really mean so be it, as it does really mean it was, it was ordered by uh, a killer, <laughs> a deadly guy, one of the most brutal rulers of all time, uh, this guy here, and also full of ego. Matter of fact, he was so full of ego that... Uh, in the story, in the original story of the Enuma Elish, the planet that crashes into Tiamat was named Nibiru. And in a later version, he had the re, he had that tablet rewritten to say Marduk instead of Nibiru because he wanted to be the destroyer. This is how big this guy's ego is. Okay. Um, now, when you hear the word God during this lecture, keep in mind that I'm not referencing the creator of the universe. I want that's very important, guys. I'm referencing the Anunnaki beings that masqueraded as gods with a lowercase g and were worshipped not only by the Sumerians, but by many civilizations that they themselves had kick-started. The Enuma Elish exists in various copies from Babylon to Assyria. The version of the uh, library of Ashurbanipal dates to the 7th century BCE. The composition of the text probably dates to the Bronze Age, to the time of Hammurabi or perhaps the early Kassite era, roughly 18th to 16th centuries BCE. Okay, we're talking about some really old stuff here. This is tablet five that was just discovered at the Sumalaya Museum in Iraq. So we got a complete and full tablet number five now, which gave us even more information about this ancient tale, this ancient story, and it's been translated already. Now, like I said, Zechariah Sitchin didn't translate any of these tablets. And I, I got to say that over and over again, because there's so much garbage and crap that has gone on over the last few years since his death. And even right before he died, a lot of even people that I thought would have been respected people in the community uh, to bring forth truth and information also did not do their research. They just went with whatever they saw on YouTube and started saying that this Zachariah Sitchin made all this up. When in fact, George Smith, born 1840 to 1876, was the English Assyriologist, apprentice, engraver, and self-taught in cuneiform in the corridors of the British Museum. Eventually, he was hired by Sir Henry Rawlinson, which was a prominent archaeologist. Smith achieved worldwide attention when he discovered an account of the flood with the obvious biblical parallels in 1872, related in the Chaldean account of the deluge. This book expands on the previous work he did and presents numerous translations of the tablets, including the first print appearance of the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is where it comes from, guys, not from Zachariah Sitchin. This is where a lot of these translations come from, okay? George Smith is one of them, and he learned directly how to do the translations at the British Museum. Here we go, another one, E.A. Spizer. In 1926, E.A. Spicer won a Guggenheim Fellowship to study the remains of the ancient Mitanni and Hurons in northern Mesopotamia. That's where Iraq is located. While there in 1927, he discovered the Tepe Guara, which means Great Mound, one of the world's earliest cradles of civilization. In 1928, he was appointed assistant professor of Semitics at the University of Pennsylvania and the full professor in 1931. He was field director of the Joint Excavation of the American Schools of Oriental Research and the University Museum in 1930 to 1932, 1936 to 1937. Undertaking excavations at Tepe Guara and Tel Billa, he also um, 
translated the, uh, the Hurrian legal text found at Newsy. After the war, he returned to the University of Pennsylvania where he was chairman of the Department of Oriental Studies from 1947 until his death in 1965. He was also appointed Elis Professor of Hebrew and Semitic Languages and Literatures there in 1954. He translated and wrote extensive commentary for the volume on Genesis in the Anchor Bible series and was one of the editors of the Torah in the New Jewish Publication Society of America version of the Old Testament. Uh, noted a student of his was uh, future professor Marsh Greenberg, who became an Israel Prize Lerat in Bible Studies. There's another person that also translated the Enumi Elish. So you see his, his, uh, his bio biography, it, it, you know, is a mile long. These are very, very learned men uh, that this Enumi Elish and a lot of these other tablets went through, you know, <laughs> their studies and their research, and they translated a lot of this content. Uh, and like I said before, a lot, a lot of authors like myself, we thank these guys. They did a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Because of what they did back then, we're able to uh, extrapolate now and, and come up with our own theories, ideas, and understandings of these ancient tablets. A little bit deeper, because I really want to drive this home. Leonard William King, okay, December 1869 to August uh, 1919, was an English archaeologist and seriologist educated at Rugby School and King's College in Cambridge. He collected stone inscriptions widely in and near the Far East, taught Assyrian and Babylonian archaeology at King's College for a number of years, and published a large number of works on these subjects. He is also known for his translations of ancient works, such as the Code of Hammurabi, which is an amazing code of script. You've got to read that script. He became the assistant to the keeper of the Egyptian Assyrian Ant Antiques, uh, Antiquities at the British Museum. Some of his works, First Steps in Assyrian, a book for beginners, being a series of historical, mythological, religious, and magical, epistolary, and other texts printed in cuneiform characters with interlinear tra transliteration and translation, and a sketch of Assyrian grammar, sign list, and vocabulary. Letters and inscriptions of Hammurabi he did in 1898, okay? <laughs> Encyclopedia Biblica, contributor, 1903. Egypt and Western Asia in the Light of Recent Discoveries, 1907. Chronicles Concerning Early Babylonian Kings, 1907, Volume 1 and 2. Legends of Babylonian and Egypt in Relation to Hebrew Tradition, Swipe Literature, 1916. The Seven Tablets of Creation, or Babylonian, the Assyrian Legends Concerning the Creation of the World and of Mankind, 1902, and the Code of Hammurabi Translation in 1899. Guys, again, much respect to Zachariah Sitchin for the work that he put in. Uh, because he was able to do exactly what a lot of authors have done. Go back to these guys who did a lot of the heavy lifting and, uh, and use their research content and their translations. That's where they came from, not from Zachariah Sitchin. This stuff can be found in the British Museum. These tablets and these, uh, uh, these scriptures, they can all be found in the British Museum. They have a lot of amazing stuff at the British Museum uh, in London. And you have, if you want to see it, you can just hop on a plane and go there if you're close by. Go out there and check it out. You'll be able to see for yourself that these things are real and they really do exist. Now, the translation part has been uh, done so well that the, the, uh, the, there's an online library. It's the UCLA CDLI Cuneiform Digital Library. And you can actually Google that on, uh, online and uh, go to your browser, type in UCLA CDLI Cuneiform Library. This screen will pop up. This is the website. And uh, this website will allow you to literally go in and grab a stone tablet on the virtual shelf, drop it into the translator tool, and read the tablet for yourself. You don't have to worry about what I think, what Zachariah thinks, what uh, you know, any of these other uh, great guys uh, who translated these tablets in the past think. You can read it for your own self, okay? which is what I highly recommend. Uh, so the translation of the tablets is no longer in question and no, it's not just one man in the world who ever translated them. There are literally now thousands of people that have translated these tablets and read the tablets and utilized this particular tool uh, to translate them as well. And now obviously being that it's, a, uh, it's, it's in a college website, it's obviously part of some college courses. Uh, and you know, <laughs> many more people are going through these tablets every single day. And there's millions of tablets. Uh, you know, so the majority of the tablets are things like IOUs and, and bills of sale and 
uh, wedding ag arrangements and agreements and things like that. Okay, really amazing stuff. Hi there, everyone. This is Neil with Portal to Ascension, and I want to just take a moment here, just a quick minute after this video. Firstly, the video that you just saw is one of the many event productions that Portal to Ascension that I've created over the years, created hundreds of events, and now we have an archive that's kind of like Netflix for Consciousness on our website. I'm just going to show you really quick how you can sign up right now and view and navigate hundreds of hours of presentations, many of them, most of them for free, and um, utilize the Portal to Ascension platform. So you go to the website, portaltoascension.org, you type in your name, email, Pretty soon we're relaunching a new website, so everything's gonna look a little bit different, but pretty much the same thing. Go to the website, enter your name, email, click sign up. You'll then within a few minutes get an email sent to your, um, t sent to you that will have login information with the temporary password to log into the site. You then go to login, you enter your email address, the password given to you, and you click login. And this will take you directly into the back end of our website, where you can navigate all of the footage that's available to you. And you can see here, you can type and start searching for a speaker, topic, whatever you want, true world history, William Henry, you can type anything over there. You can look at, you can browse by category, advanced technology, ancient civilizations, ascension, conference, conscious business, conspiracies, divine feminine, evolution of consciousness, extraterrestrial awareness, hot chakra, holistic healing, and so on and so on and so on. And then you can even browse by speaker here and you can see on the right hand side starts with Adam Apollo in alphabetical order and you can browse by each speaker and look at their videos as well and the way it works is we have it all split up here my webinars which is where we are right now my watch list so you can add things to your watch list watch later and then documentaries where you can watch documentaries and interviews that we've done all the presentations are laid out in the grid over for here for you here all you have to do to watch one is click on it And there you go, it's right here. We also have suggested webinars for you, the description, the speaker info, the speaker bio page. So it's really become a one-stop shop for consciousness. So if you wanna check out the full presentation of what you just saw, if you wanna check out any other of these presentations or just have this place, this amazing resource for you that's a one-stop shop for all things consciousness, where not only do we have all this content and footage from the past, but we're constantly creating events and footage every single week we do around 110 events a year at this point 80 percent of them are online so go ahead and sign up go to portal and take a look at all the amazing information that we have there for you